dear professors, dear students and all participants, uh, good evening to everyone. I would like to thank the Blavatnik School of, Eco of Government and the Oxford University Italian Society for uh, such uh, a kind invitation. It's a great honor to have the opportunity to give a speech in one of the most world's uh, uh, prestigious academic institutions. And uh, I would like, in particular, Sir Ivo Roberts and uh, Ms. Francesca Ghillani for welcoming me here today. In uh, this university, uh, many of brightest minds uh, from uh, the UK and from uh, the other parts of the world were uh, trained and uh, cultivated. And uh, many generations of uh, Oxonian uh, politicians uh, studied here and make uh, this place uh, a benchmark for the, uh, for the production and the diffusion of knowledge uh, worldwide. And uh, in particular, I would like to stress the importance of the mission of the Blavatnik School of Government, which adopts a multicultural approach to address issues of national and global governance. Such academic centers elaborate and offer the appropriate tools to, re to read today's high complexity and can help us read through the interrelations between national and international policies. These are the main reasons why it is important for me to be here this afternoon, but also because the government I am part of attaches great importance to the dialogue with universities. Prime Minister Renzi always finds opportunities to meet with the academic community during his mission abroad. And uh, I had myself the opportunity and the honor to speak at the University de la Sorbonne when I traveled to Paris a few months ago. I believe universities are a key component to establish a virtuous circle between governments and the civil societies, laying on strong foundations which are knowledge and culture. Today in my remarks I would like to give you an overview of where Italy stands in its institutional reform process. I am not going to overload you with lots of technicalities. I will be pleased to answer to your questions and to go into further depth afterwards. First and foremost, I would primarily like to leave you with a picture, the clearest possible picture of the rationale underlying our efforts. The goal of my government's reform action is, in a nutshell, to change Italy. I am aware this is extremely ambitious and also hard especially in a country where it seems impossible to deliver structural reforms after decades of political and institutional standstill. In fact, we have been facing a difficult challenge, but we see that this outcome is at hand, which makes us even more optimistic. When I took office as Minister for Constitutional Reforms and the relationship with Parliament back in 2014, we were surrounded by a very complicated political environment. The result of the general election in 2013 made it impossible to form a clear and stable majority, thus creating a situation of political instability, which lasted for one year. The Renzi government was formed also with this precise mission to put an end to the instability which had characterized Italy's republican history history described by volatile parliamentary majorities, fragile cabinets, political uncertainty, inefficiencies in the distribution of powers between central and local governments. You might be surprised by the fact that this government is the 63rd over the 70 years of <coughs> Italy's republican history. I guess this information should be pretty striking for British people who are used to a political and electoral system which is very well known for its ability to guarantee stability. But why are we so committed to deliver a new setting to Italy's political institutions? Does the public sector still matter today in a globalized world where interconnections of any kind can put in touch people, companies, organizations so easily and quickly? 
My answer is yes. To be more precise, I think the role of the public sector is even more important in this changed environment. Political institutions must provide the appropriate framework where all these interconnections take place. An efficient, accountable, responsive, stable and light framework so as to allow the wall of the society to grow safe and prosperous. Political institutions have not to overburden citizens with the excess of bureaucracy, nor to be an obstacle to their lives because of inefficiencies. They have to support the community by enabling people to live freely in safety, to run their businesses, to obtain a rich education and decent jobs, to build up their houses and families. To renew trust and confidence between electors and politicians, we have to replace the present bicameral system. In this view, it becomes clear why it was, it was necessary to provide Italy with more efficient institutions. This is why we firmly decided to go down the way of reforms, which I will now briefly illustrate. The first pillar of the reform architecture I have had the honor to design and to carry out is the constitutional reform. The bill will be approved in the last reading by the Chamber exactly this week, after two years and more than 83 million of amendments proposed by the oppositions. It aims at overcoming bicameralism, transforming the Senate and reforming the division of responsibility between central and some national governments. In Italy, we have been discussing the reform of the bicameral system for over 30 years. Any attempt to achieve it had always failed. This system, based on the perfect equivalence between the lower and the upper house, the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate, had proved to be one of the main sources of Italy's standstill. In this particular juncture, characterized by economic and social stagnation, it became clear that we could not afford this anymore. It became clear that we had to improve how our parliament works. In other words, that we needed a better parliament. For this reason, both the former president of the Italian Republic, Napolitano, and Sergio Mattarella, who spoke about it also in his recent visit in the USA, had always supported the need of the constitutional reform process. The constitutional reform redesigns the structure of the bicameral parliament, altering the nature and the composition of the Senate that becomes a chamber representing regional and local institutions. The first key component of the reform is the composition of the Senate. With the ongoing reform, the Senate becomes a second tier body reducing its members from the current 315 down to 100 members. 95 senators will be proportionally elected by the regional councils and autonomous provinces from among their members and mayors. Up to five senators can be appointed by the President of the Republic for their outstanding merits for a seven-year mandate. Not only the composition of the Senate will change, but also its functioning. The bill envisages a simplification of the legislative procedure. On one hand, the bicameral legislative procedure provided for an expressly defined number of laws, such as constitutional reforms and constitutional laws. Now it will be extended to some other categories of legislation, mostly connected to the nature of the new Senate, such as laws that directly implement specific constitutional provisions, laws concerning fundamental functions of local bodies, legislation concerning general principles and terms for the participation of Italy in the European Union decision-making process and its implementation, and legislation concerning ineligibility and incompatibility of the status of senator. On the other hand, the rejection, the rejection of amendments proposed by the Senate that can be overridden by the Chamber through a vote of absolute majority by its members has been limited to only one matter, the activation of the so-called supremacy clause, whereby the state under government proposal 
can legislate on matters or on factions falling outside its, its exclusive legislative competencies. <coughs> this is aimed at preserving the legal or economic unity of the Republic or the national interest of the state. For any other issue, the Senate can only advise the Chamber, which has the power to express the final decision. In all, case, in all cases, the intervention of the Senate links the need of state legislation with those of regional legislation, avoiding subsequent conflicts between the state and regions that would otherwise require the intervention of the Constitutional Court. All the above mentioned changes are designed to make the legislative process more efficient. Furthermore, the bill aims to eradicate the causes of delays in the decision-making process and defines, if requested by the government, a timeline for the approval of priority bills with the introduction of the mechanism of voting by a set date. Within 70 days, if that bill is crucial for the government's program. This is one of the main aspects of the reform that affects the legislative procedure allowing the government, just like in the United Kingdom, to have a more significant role in fixing the House's agenda and to assure the fulfillment of this political schedule. This preferential lawmaking process does not cover bicameral laws, electoral laws, the ratification of international treaties, and laws requiring absolute majorities. I should say that the initial drafts of the bill allowed the government to choose not only the date but also the content to be approved and, is it, and it's for the French vote bloqué. The system adopted resulting from the amendments approved during parliamentary examination is not a diminution of democracy but represents a type of rationalized parliamentary system. I believe that the combination of the two instruments was the best solution to enable the government and parliament to operate more efficiently. In this respect, I would like to remind you what Professor Piero Calamandrei, one of the founding fathers of the Italian Constitution written in 1948, said before the Constituent Assembly. If a democratic system cannot give itself a government that governs, it is doomed to fail. Finally, the bill provides for more several rules concerning the use of decreased laws. Therefore, thanks to the new procedure of scheduled votes on bills and the limiting of decrees, the Parliament and the Government shall be encouraged to legislate with ordinary laws. In conclusion, these are real democratic guarantees that represent a counterweight to the powers of the Government concerning its legislative work. Another aim of the constitutional reform is to reallocate the powers between the state and the regions. Indeed, the current division of competences has been characterized by a strong fragmentation in the division of legislative responsibilities between the state and regions. This is why the entire system suffers from uncertainty concerning legislation, the implementation of policies, overlaps and conflicts. These flows in the allocation of powers have undoubtedly had an influence on the development of current economic and structural policies. The Reform Bill gives the state competence on both the decisions requiring wider strategic choices and on the decisions that require uniform treatment throughout the country for citizens of all regions. The Reform foresees the elimination of the concurrent or shared legislative competences between states and regions aiming at reducing constitutional litigation that has congested the constitutional court. The introduction of a supremacy clause, as mentioned before. The possibility for the state to delegate regions its legislative tasks for some matters, falling under its exclusive competence if their budget is in balance. On the public spending side, it is up to the state legislation to fix standard indicators of costs and needs in order to implement a more efficient allocation of resources concerning the delivery of public functions of all autonomous entities. The abolition of the constitutional provision on provinces is strictly linked to a reform that was approved in May 2014. This reform has produced a relevant 
reorganization of the provincial territories, among which has to be mentioned the institution of the metropolitan cities. To sum up, I think it is clear that this reorganization provides for a new model of relationship between state, regions, and local bodies, a model whose aim is to streamline the governmental process by avoiding duplications and waste of public money. The second leg of our political reforms refers to the electoral law. If there are in this room political scientists with a specific expertise in electoral laws, they will probably remember that Italy experimented over the last 20 years two different voting systems. Unfortunately, none of them was able to overcome the structural problems characterized by a high degree of, a, of fragmentation of political parties, which systematically used to undermine the government's stability. The urgency of a new electoral law became absolutely clear after the general election in 2013 when the party of relative majority, the PD, to which I belong, won the election but was not able to obtain a sufficient number of seats in the Senate to rule autonomously. The difficulties experienced in those months when the risk of political standstill reached its peak and the country was facing its deepest economic crisis since World War II, convinced us to find a solution. This solution would have had to follow a very simple key principle. That is, that it is necessary to identify the winner of the elections immediately after closing the ballots. This is how the Italicum, a sort of nickname, nickname given to the electoral law, was conceived. Therefore, Italy has a new electoral system for the election of the Chamber of Deputies approved on May of uh, 2015 and scheduled to enter into force from July 2016. Aimed at ensuring governab governability, the law provides for facilitating the formation of a stable majority in Parliament and consequently a stable government that serves its full five years term. It reduces at the same time the degree of, of fragmentation and it puts an end to the veto power of small political parties. Somehow, this new electoral system allows Italy to achieve all the essential conditions ensuring a real and modern parliamentary government. In fact, the previous electoral law had been annulled by the Constitutional Court in 2014 because it assured any way majority bonus to the winning coalition of parties without forcing any minimum threshold. With the new law, if a party reaches a consensus, a consensus of at least 40%, it will be rewarded 55% of the seats, allowing for stability, credibility, rapid decision making, and the ability of a government to complete its five-year term. The new electoral law will encourage parties to change their political offer and to become entirely responsible for the implementation of their political program. We decided, in fact, to attribute the majority bonds to the winner party and no longer to the coalition in order to avoid in the future the creation of artificial and unreliable majorities. The bonus attribution to the list rather than to the coalition is a legislative choice of deep political and institutional innovation. It involves the empowerment of the political parties and therefore a benefit of transparency for the voters after years of predominance of the logic of coalitions. It also establishes a closer link between candidates and their constituents and moreover for effective rules concerning gender equality in elections. The electoral reform concerns only the election of the Chamber of Deputies. It is, so, it is to be a proportional system with a majority bonus for the party with the highest number of valid votes that exceeds the threshold of 40% of the vote. The majority bonus is set at 15% of the seats to enable the winning party to have 340 out of 630 seats. In particular, according to the new electoral law, regions are divided into 100 constituencies with a given number of seats for each constituency in proportion to the number of inhabitants. 
the number of constituency is quite elevated for Italy compared with the past. That is to allow the creation of short list of candidates who can be easily known and recognized by voters. Each party submits an electoral role and every citizen can express up to two preferences for a male and a female candidate and the heads of the list are automatically elected if the list obtain the necessary votes. <coughs> the promotion of gender equality is a very important point in every reform of our government. We have, for instance, recently approved a bill that encourages women's political presence and empowerment in regional councils. Electoral law roles must ensure gender equality and cannot include more than two consecutive candidates of the same sex. A party needs a minimum of 3% of the vote to get a seat in Parliament. If no party reaches the 40% threshold, the two parties that receive the highest number of votes proceed to a runoff. Ultimately, the electoral reform does not only contribute significantly to the strengthening of stability and decision-making capacity of the institutional system, but it also provides a result in terms of electoral representation thanks to a more conscious choice by the electoral made on the basis of a more transparent proposal of political parties. In fact, this reform impacts, impacts on the party system, calling them to a strong commitment to transparency in offering policy in the electoral competition. To, the, to this aim, the law excluded the possibility for parties to form an electoral coalition, defines very little constituencies in which candidates compete to attract the voter choice through the preference voting. With the ballot, voters will vote for the political offer already chosen in the first round, if it remains in competition, or the policy proposal that they feel less distant from their preferences. This is why the credibility and clarity of political proposal will be crucial. To wrap up, this set of reforms will have a profound impact on the way our political institution used to work. I would like to leave you with four key words, which are the basic principles of this innovation architecture. Accountability. Thanks to clear majorities and the need to present well-defined political programs, MPs and members of government will be constantly held responsible for their decisions and behaviour. Transparency. There will no longer be incentives to play games behind the scenes. Moreover, a streamlined legislative process will make sure that laws are approved with a clear and simple procedure. Efficiency. The system, both at the central and local level, will be put in the conditions to deliver quickly. Responsiveness, the new, role, the new rules and settings will allow the legislator to provide policy responses to the country's needs, removing any kind of alibi before procrastinating key decisions. Prime Minister Renzi announced the government plans to hold a referendum in 2060s. Regardless of the majority, the bill on the constitutional reform is approved by. I think this is an important <coughs> sign that the government is willing to listen to the people. The citizen support is crucial to complete our reform process. I am sure these reforms will mark a milestone to re-establish the citizens' trust into politics. It should be not surprising at all, if any system, anti-system parties have recently gained so much support in Europe, as well as in Italy. Over the last few years, a wide gap was created between institutions and citizens. With these reforms, we are now trying to fill that gap. My feeling is utterly positive. As you could see, there are already several factors signaling that in Italy things are finally getting better. <coughs> confidence in citizens and consumers is recovering the economy started to grow again. I know this is not enough, but I am sure we are on the right track. I am aware this process will take time. It is clear that through these reforms our government is not looking for low-hanging fruits. We decide to undertake a difficult, challenging path but we are sure this path will lead to a new, stronger Italy, ready to cope with the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you for your attention.